a group that was a new technology group looking to produce some of these tests in the home market so that they could be a home pregnancy test, for instance. Uh, and we had worked with, uh, very carefully with uh, uh, new, new techniques in delivery uh, where you could do mass amounts of protein attached to small plastic particles. So I learned a lot about uh, material science there as well. And that is why I was hired uh, through headhunters to come to Minnesota to look at uh, a job that, that was uh, produced by um, Santa Fe Diagnostics Pasteur, which is a French company in Minneapolis. And there uh, we worked on uh, diagnostic tests, but more importantly, I think, is the experience I had with the new technologies. Um, I learned very carefully how to produce blood tests with a new technology, and in fact, three new technologies. Um, I actually won a science award uh, for technology and putting the biomolecules on them. Since that time, uh, and that, I guess that was uh, 11 years ago when I quit that job, uh, since that time, I have worked for uh, Northwestern College in uh, Roseville, Minnesota. And uh, for the last 11 years, I've been teaching a variety of classes there. Why did you take the job at Northwestern? Or what, what did they ask you to do? <clears throat> well, actually, I had a choice of going into technology again, uh, biotechnology. There's plenty of uh, companies in the Twin Cities where you can do biotechnology. But I... I don't know if I can explain it easily. I really had a, a, a yen to try teaching um, because I had not really been a, a professor in a college before, although I had taught extensively through the businesses. So um, I was uh, hired because of my extensive background in teaching in business and uh, teaching uh, bio and biotechnology. They had a two-year associate degree in science, and it uh, had just been approved by the state of Minnesota to be upgraded to a four-year bachelor's degree. So they had no one to teach the third and fourth year classes. In fact, there were no third and fourth year classes. So my job was to invent them. And in fact, um, doing uh, curriculum development for all upper division classes. Uh, that's quite a challenge. Uh, most, most people go into the university system or any kind of college system and take over a position, not invent two years of classes. So I have a unique uh, experience under my belt here for 11 years of developing classes for developmental biology, immunology, um, animal biology, physiology, biochemistry, principles of biology, concepts of biology. I think there's more. Uh, did you run into evolutionary theory in developing the curriculum for those courses? Everywhere. In my first year teaching there, um, this being a Christian college, I sort of wondered whether or not I would be at odds uh, teaching in a Christian college and teaching evolutionary theory. Um, what I found was that the students um, did a very good job of provoking me. Um, and I use that word uh, provoke into knowing the evolutionary science very well. And I did not know it that well in my first year. And I realized, a very sharp example for me here, was that I realized that all of my undergraduate biology, all of my master's degree biology, and all of my doctoral biology uh, had only been uh, very superficial in how it presented evolution. I knew all the standard uh, jargon. I knew all the standard theories. I knew all the standard uh, propositions. But when I was teaching in the textbooks, what I did not know is how it actually operated. I had never been really taught how it actually operated. Well, did, I, you, did you use uh, evolutionary theory in your operational science when you were working for Abbott Labs and a couple of these other places? I would say probably not at all. Not at all. In fact, I realized over those 15 years of um, research and development that I didn't run into anyone who ever even mentioned evolution. It was not a topic of con conversation over lunch, over anything. It has no meaning. 
in operational science out there, it really has no meaning. The, uh, the argument has been made that <clears throat> in Kansas, if the minority report would somehow be embraced by the state, that that would drive bioscience out of the state, probably along with many other economic resources. Would you comment on that? <clears throat> uh, that's interesting. Um, uh, I don't know how that could be possible. Uh, not only have I never run into evolution in in a variety of companies, uh, I seldom run into it at all with any of my colleagues uh, in the University of Minnesota, of which I have several friends working there still. Uh, it seems to come up as a topic of conversation only if someone is actually teaching evolutionary science. Other than that, it does not seem to come up in anyone's research, per se. In fact, I've been told by colleagues that if it wasn't for the, this is their words, if it wasn't for the fact that it was required of them in their conclusions to make evolutionary claims, uh, they would not put it in their papers at all. And what I find is that uh, that's probably fairly true with most researchers who are in the many disciplines uh, who are looking at very narrow investigative areas. As a biochemist, I, am, I, was, I was so deep into very narrow areas of how biomolecules work and how to modify them and how to make them profitable, in, in fact, that there is uh, no, uh, no reason to vary outside of that. Um, in fact, I read an, an article on a, on a website recently that uh, was complaining, if you will, about the biochemist coming here to testify, and the individual said that, oh, that's okay, he's a biochemist, they usually don't know much about evolution. And I, I twinged at that a bit, and I realized that that was absolutely true, except that now for 11 years, my students have forced me to learn about evolution. So they have provoked me. The students provoked me to know everything about evolution because they came up with so many questions. The textbooks were very um, dogmatic in their approach to evolution, especially ma macroevolution and origins. No one had any trouble in my class uh, talking about microevolution and diversity. Not, no questions come from that. Everyone's just amazed how well that works together. But everyone has questions about how macroevolution can work. I found 11 years ago that I couldn't answer that. Now, 11 years later, I still can't answer that. And I read everything. I have the opportunity in my position of not having research required of me. So I dabble in research with, with students for their own specific research purposes because it's very important that they have specific research projects that they can show we have uh, colloquiums and that are available for them at the University of Minnesota in our own school at various other schools that they can show that they have actually done uh, specific personal research projects. So yes, we work with research, but I do not have to have grants. I do not have to have um, a par publish or perish attitude. It is not put upon me by my institution. That has allowed me to dabble into the fine art of reading everything I can. And that has helped me so much to understand exactly what evolution says and what evolution cannot say by the data. Uh, Dr. Simmet, uh, we were talking about this and you explained to me how you began to develop curriculum and I think you said I first went to the textbooks and you would study the materials in the section dealing with microevolution and then you would move to other chapters further on in the book. You talk a bit about that. Some of the uh, provocation coming from the students um, came from the wording within the textbooks. In the chapters, for instance, in genetics, when I teach that course, the, the wording, the verbs, if you will, used in describing mutations is very precise and very accurate and very declarative. They, with data, are able to declare that the mutations are deleterious, that there are insertions, deletions, etc., and that they cause problems with the function of that gene. And then when we get to the chapter on 
Mac Revolution, the question is asked, and this is pages later, chapters later, the question is asked, can Mac Revolution lead to new forms of life? And the answer in one word was certainly. And then all of a sudden, the verbs change to what I call soft verbs. No longer is it we know, we have tested, data shows. It is now should have, could have, must have been. And my students picked up on that and wondered why all of a sudden there aren't declarative verbs here and everything is very soft in its wording. Uh, that was provoking me. I had to find out why. So I've been reading extensively and, and the textbooks are written accurately. It is a lot of soft verbs. There has to be because there's a lot of stories of how it possibly could have happened. But there is no data to back that up such that we can say we have tested or we have uh, produced uh, such a phenomena. Is it, is it fair to say that what caused you to begin to challenge evolutionary theory was uh, you're asking, uh, you're being asked to develop new curriculum? Oh, yes. If I, if I had not been uh, uh, finding these chapters in these textbooks, I probably would not have um, been involved with evolution uh, at all. Uh, in fact, some of my textbooks uh, don't mention evolution uh, maybe in passing. Um, my physiology textbook is pretty much devoid of using the term evolution. Uh, my biochemistry textbooks are, are scant. In fact, I go to the index to find everywhere that it's mentioned so I can read exactly what is being said there so that I can address the issue for the students. And uh, the entries in the index in the biochemistry textbooks is about three or four entries, five entries maybe, in the entire textbook. When it comes to genetics, then in, there's, there's a whole column of entries in the index. So it's referred to often. And, and talked about and described often. So with uh, developmental biology, for instance, uh, there is a, uh, a fair amount, in fact, a lot of evolution mentioned there. So I am challenged in certain classes, and in other classes, it's, it's hardly mentioned. We ask you to look at the uh, proposals in the minority report, in particular the evolution benchmark. That's... Um, Benchmark 3 of Standard 3, grades 8 through 12. And I'd like to direct your attention to uh, that benchmark that hopefully will come up on the screen here in a minute. <clears throat> and let's begin with uh, the beginning of that benchmark. Uh, uh, indicator 1A adds additional descriptive information about evolution. By the way, <clears throat> I notice in... Uh, on the left side of the column, it says biological evolution descent with modification is a scientific explanation for the history of the diversification of organ, organisms. What, what is the role of history in biological evolution, and how does that affect explanation? Uh, that's rather interesting. Uh, the word history uh, used in, in biology is, um, is a best guess at, at best. Uh, it tends to be... Uh, used only if um, if we are trying to determine how a function came about today. Uh, when we do, for instance, um, a history of a disease, if we do something in physiology with that regard, we will look back and, and use history to help us understand it in, t in today's world. Uh, what I'm finding with the evolutionary claim, however, is that the Mac revolution um, History, if we look back at that orig origins history, uh, has little to bear on science today in terms of its actual practical uh, use and what we're actually doing with it. And I'm realizing that that's probably why it's not being actually uh, talked about out there in the marketplace um, of ideas. Um, in the companies, in the universities, it's not being used on a day-to-day -day basis in their research uh, for most by the vast majority of disciplines, that the history uh, is just that. It's a, it's a story that we have to make up because we don't know. It's not that we have a historical record to look at so easily, especially with origins. What we have is uh, 
our best guess, which means it's out of us. Uh, would you uh, comment on indicator uh, additional specificity 1A, uh, the, particularly the first sentence, biological evolution postulates an unpredictable and unguided natural process that has no discernible direction or goal. Is that a scientifically accurate description of biological evolution? Oh, yes, it is. That, that is exactly what it says in the textbook. Um, the second sentence also, it also assumes that life arose from an unguided natural process. Is that a that's valid also, statement? That's also in the textbooks, yes. Exactly that way. That is not anything different than what I've been reading and teaching for the last decade. Is, is, it, is that information important to a student's understanding of biological evolution? Well, absolutely. I think uh, the, the definition of, of evolution um, cannot be... Um, minced or, or reduced um, if, if that's what, in, in fact, the, the papers are publishing about, then that's what the textbooks have to reflect, and in fact they do. So if you're not teaching that exactly as it's, as it's being proclaimed, well, then you're not teaching evolution. So yes, I think you need to, everyone needs to understand exactly what evolution's basis is. And I, and I think and I think Perhaps in my own experience, um, I've had to meet that challenge also in that, uh, again, coming out of a Christian college, I sort of, uh, you know, wondered what kind of trouble do I run into if I wanted to minimize, if I feel like I should be minimizing something, uh, evolutionary theory, for instance, um, and, and will there be pressures put upon me? And I was very concerned about that. Uh, what was very refreshing for me is that uh, my college has virtually had no restraints on me in teaching biology. Um, that's very refreshing. So I've been very open to talk about exactly what's in the textbook. And, but because of the students and the way they're provoking me, I have to know my evolutionary science very well. And I come up short on origins, and I come up short on methodological naturalism to get into macroevolution. What is methodological naturalism? Well... It's sort of, it's, 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 besides hard to say, it's actually quite straightforward, uh, that nature has a method. So, um, which is a little bit in conflict with, if you will, with the wording of, of unguided process. So nature has a method, but it's an unguided process. So the word method and unguided have a, have a tension there. Um, so if you have an unguided process, then, then that's your method. So it's saying that the, the nature, which has no discerning direction to it, will make a change in a, in a gene sequence and change, in fact, one nucleotide um, at random. So therefore, it's unguided. So that is the method, that it is, in fact, unguided. So that one change in that nucleotide will make that DNA produce a protein that is different. Um, so that's the method of nature, according to that. Uh, whether or not that can work or not is the question. D does uh, methodological naturalism essentially limit explanation to an unguided process? I think it, it has to. Um, methodological naturalism then, by virtue of its name, states that nature is doing this so that, in fact, it not only is unguided, it has to be unguided. Because okay. we, uh, we cannot find an intelligent molecule. We cannot find an intelligent force that would connect these nucleotides up to each other. Uh, there's nothing um, in any of the literature, and there's nothing that we have ever found that says a particular nucleotide would want to bind to any other particular nucleotide for the purpose of making a proper sequence that would be the proper sequence to make the proper protein. Uh, we don't have any forces that would know how to do that. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, going back to the first sentence in 1A, it says, biological evol evolution postulates an unpredictable and unguided natural process. Now, that is stated in the nature of a theory or as a postulate. And that being the case, uh, doing science, we should be able to challenge that postulate that change uh, uh, results from an unguided process. Is that correct? 
Uh, I mean, science should, we should be able to challenge that. Yeah, and all, all things should be available for challenging. Uh, that has been part of my anger with science, is that uh, nothing is sacred is the norm for all other disciplines except evolution. Then all of a sudden it becomes the sacred cow. I have had an occasional outburst in class by me when I'm lecturing, when I have to tell students that, by golly, when I, t when I did my uh, master's research, thesis research, and when I did my postdoctoral research, and when I did uh, 15 years in the companies uh, with their research, uh, everything, everything is held up to scrutiny and skeptical analysis. Nothing is left untouched. Nothing is taken for granted. Nothing is taken on faith. Everything must be proven. And you can make theories about what's unproven, but then you call them theories. And if they get proven, and enough people can corroborate that, then you might be calling it something other than a theory, or better than a theory. But when you have open-ended questions, and you have nice stories about how that might happen, then you still don't call that <coughs> anything other than a theory. Nobody else gets away with that. Peer review editors don't let you get away with that. In your conclusions, you say, and I speculate. You don't say, this is the truth because I made this story up, but not in evolution. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, does methodological naturalism permit one to challenge that postulate that the process is unguided? Well, that's why I get angry in class, uh, because it doesn't allow that. I want to challenge it, but my textbook says I cannot. So I have to go outside the textbook. So I find other papers that, have, that are, in fact, challenging that. Uh, I have found many papers that challenge the, the going norm, that it is not challengeable. I have found many papers. In fact, I have um, put together uh, several talks in the Twin Cities just about that, um, pointing out what other people are saying about the data and how, in fact, it doesn't support gradualism or that it doesn't support uh, abiotic to biotic in the soup or that the fossil record with its um, Cambrian explosion is not supporting a gradualistic Darwinian or neo-Darwinian uh, uh, concept. Uh, one has to come up with a, a very fast mutation rate that is still good, and we don't have any information that you could have a fast mutation rate and still be reasonable and not kill things. In fact, we don't have data to show that slow mutation rates give you something positive that you could actually develop with. And I have a lot on that as well. Standard 3, benchmark 3, and this deals with the, the changes the minority report offered with respect to the, the section on biological evolution. Do, do you have any general comment on those changes? Are they appropriate or inappropriate? Or, uh, well, I think, they're, I think they're very appropriate in this regard. Um, my students coming out of a Christian college are now armed with all of evolution, exactly what it teaches, and exactly what its downfall is, or its shortcomings. Uh, they know what it can show, and they know what it can't show. Um, I would say that they're probably better armed than their counterparts who are going to the University of Minnesota, who are not shown what, in fact, it can show and cannot show. So who has more knowledge, and who has more accurate knowledge? Uh, those who know what a theory can do and what it can't, or those who are just told the party line. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, uh, Mr. Gonagheri, uh, you can commit your question. Mr. Gonagheri, you have uh, 16 minutes. Thank you. Sir, the first question I'd like to ask you is, um, do you accept the evolutionary theory of common descent of humans from pre-hominids? Uh, from the data that I've been following, it's uh, probably not true. I'd like to now specifically address the issues in the standards that you have discussed. Is there anywhere that you have been able to find in the standards a 
an indication to teachers and their students that they are not allowed to discuss evolution in every aspect, including whatever shortcomings may be involved in evolution today. I believe that the standard is setting up uh, this state to fail at biology. That wasn't my question. I know it wasn't. Then please answer the question. Is there anything in the standards that would preclude a teacher and his or her students from discussing fully evolution, including whatever shortcomings their students may question? I believe that the standard, as it's written, does not preclude that. Is there in the standards anywhere at all that you have been able to ascertain the use of the word unguided? It is in the definition of evolution. And it's in the def definition of... Um, Where in the definition of evolution in the standards do you find that? The standard, as it, excuse me, let me start this. The standard does not have to mention that. Please, please answer my question. My question was specifically to you, where in the standards is the word unguided found? It is found implicit in the definition of evolution. I'm not talking about implicitly. Where is the word it unguided is, it found? It is not in the standard, and it does not have to be. If it doesn't have to be, and if it's not in the standard, isn't it a fact that the only reason it is suggested in the comments for the minority is to have a straw man argument? Oh, not at all. Not at all. I don't think so. You have made the claim from the floor that methodological naturalism entails that nature is unguided. What would you say to the millions of people, including many scientists, who believe that God works through the natural process? Many of those people believe that it is guided through the natural process. Some of them believe that it is unguided through the natural process. Well, sir, you made the broad statement that method methodological naturalism entails that nature is unguided. That's what you said. That's its, that's its definition. I didn't say that as if I was making it up. But that definition does not mean, does it, that there are not many, many thousands of scientists who believe that that is precisely how God works. I do not know that. I have nothing further. Thank you. I'm sorry to pronounce your name. Is it Dr. Simmet? That's close enough. How do you say it? Simmet. Simmet. Well, welcome to Kansas. It's a beautiful you. state. Maybe you'll get, get out and get to see some more of it. When you are testing your students, how do you handle this issue? Well, they have to know all of the evolutionary uh, theory and all of its um, uh, tenets. Uh, and then I also ask them on all the additional information that I have brought forth into class that I cannot find in my textbook. So they have to know it all. Okay. So uh, in the state of Kansas, in elementary and secondary education, we assess, and the assessments are built around the standards. So uh, 
What would be your advice to us as, as the board who has the constitutional authority to provide general oversight? Uh, what should we do to make sure that students are taught evolution and its criticisms and they are assessed both items knowing that, that what's in the standards is what gets taught and is what gets tested? Uh, here's how it works at Northwestern College. Um, I do not work in the education department. I work in the biology department. However, our education department has a science methods class for K through 12. I come in for two lectures and I teach after they, excuse me, after they have taught them the evolutionary tenets, I come in and give the rest of the data of what in fact is out there but not in the textbook of what is, what is supportable and what is not supportable. So we do that with, um, actually it's um, four lectures. Um, so we, we add that to their curriculum and I come in from the biology department because I happen to read all this and the person who does the science methods cannot keep up with that, although she's very knowledgeable. So yes, we add that in there as a complement to that after they've learned all of the tenets of evolution. And then they are tested on knowing exactly what evolution can and cannot do in terms of true data and true conclusions. Hmm. So true data, true conclusions. If we want quality education in Kansas, we should also teach evolution and its criticisms. Wouldn't you agree? Is that what you do at your school? Well, for macroevolution and, and, and origins, um, if you're going to teach just from the textbook and those tenets of what it should be able to do, then you're not actually teaching the story, the entire story of evolution. You're teaching a segment of it. Okay, thank you. Dr. Slot, how would you describe the ability of the majority draft as well as the uh, minority report to teach the students to distinguish the data and testable theories of science from religion and philosophical claims that are made in the name of science? That was a long question. I, okay. How would you describe the ability of each one of those, the majority report and the minority report, with reference to teaching the student to distinguish the data and testable theories of science from religious and philosophical claims that are made in the name of science? Um, well, the modified uh, program, the modified document, is going to go much further than the original with regard to expecting students to know exactly what science is. Uh, what, what I really detest is dummy down science. And so I think with the standards saying that you can in fact talk about all of the data, they're going to learn about, and that's what those standards will show them, that you can learn about exactly how far science can go in, in producing data and making conclusions and where you must actually say now I'm, I'm emerging on um, a theory or um, a story that I think is probably true, but at least it becomes honest science when in, when in fact um, uh, you can differentiate the difference between uh, data-dependent conclusions and data-independent conclusions. And I think that's what the standards have to show, that you can show the difference between those two things. This is data-dependent conclusions and these are data above the data or data-independent conclusions. Okay. So I think the standards can do that if you allow them to. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, Catherine. Our former uh, presenter, Dr. Wells, and now I hear maybe you saying that in our textbooks, we're not always getting a thorough coverage of evolution. We may be getting the methodological, naturalistic uh, presentation. Okay, so maybe this is one reason why we do need these proposals, these minority proposals in our standards to assure that our teachers are realizing the textbooks are not always covering the material to the best, uh, you know, to show the shortcomings? Is that what? I think, I think what um, Dr. Wells showed earlier when that, on his map um, is an indicator that, um, with his comments, there's an indicator that uh, there's a sweep across this country that would like to teach methods of how to investigate. 
and that's a, really the heart of science. What I, what I really like to do is get out of the classroom then and, and apply all those classroom principles to actual how do we do methodology, how do we do um, uh, science research, and follow that with fidelity. And that's the issue. So, and I think the standards have to reflect that we need to teach how we do science very well. And then, therefore, we'll be able to see that we can make conclusions or we start making something that becomes theoretical. And it's okay to have those theories. I don't think we should take any of that out. But we better claim what we can claim and tell what, in fact, is beyond the data. And then also from your introduction, I understand that you had a perfectly good career in biotechnology and you really were not aware of evolution as the way it was taught in textbooks, supposedly, and so that this lack of or de-emphasizing evolution is not going to ruin a student's chance of getting a biotechnology industry. Um, no, no, it doesn't stop it. All of, literally, we are, we are real close to 100 percent of placement of our students into medicine, uh, technology, uh, graduate schools. Uh, almost everybody is going into what, what they want to do. Uh, evolution is not even asked about, unless, of course, you were going into evolutionary science at a university. They want to know do you, where you stand with that if you're going to become a, looking to work in their department, perhaps. Dr. Samada, I have been a proponent and stated earlier and will state again, like your comment on it, of empirical science as defined by observable, measurable, testable, repeatable, and falsifiable. And uh, would you comment on that? Yeah. Well, the empiricism is the heart of science. And once you start leaving empiricism, you need, it's okay, but you need to say it. And you need to know the difference between what's empirically and, and supportable and what is, in fact, become uh, more of a story. I'm, I'm amazed at how well the reverse engineer stories look. They look very good, and they're very compelling of, of how they're engineered. But they are, in fact, engineered. And we don't have data, especially when it becomes a historical science. We, we, that's total engineering. Uh, we have fun with the... Uh, I actually brought uh, photocopies of... Uh, my textbook on general biology where they show um, the primordial soup. And so I was very entertained and bemused, uh, as always. And it, it's very interesting, but there are so many tenants, thank you, there are so many tenants that have to be perfect for that to happen. And so it's written that way, that all these things would have to have fallen into place. That's wonderful. It makes very nice reading, but of course it's historical science and it doesn't have any data. So. Thank you, Dr. Samad. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a 20-minute break. It is now 3.10. We're going to uh, resume promptly at 3.30. Dr. Abrams, uh, members of the committee, uh, as our next witness, we would like to call Jespi Cermonte. Jespi, would you please come forward? Okay. I'd like to introduce you to uh, Dr. Giuseppe Sermonti. Dr. Sermonti, I really wish to thank you for coming all the way from Italy. And in some notes I have here, it indicates that uh, you're a retired professor of genetics at the University of Perugia. Peru, Perugia, yes. And that you discovered genetic recombination in antibiotic producing penicillin and streptomycin. Is that correct? Almost. And you also um, gave me a list of some questions that you would ask, like me to ask you. Mm -hmm. And the first one is, what was the real contribution of Darwin to natural sciences? This is an interesting question. <laughs> because the common idea is that the real contribution of Darwin is, that, is the concept of natural selection which he shared with Wallace, his younger contemporary. Well, not natural selection, but what was called at this time actualism. Actualism. Which means that we should find the explanation of the phenomena we see around us, of the history of our, uh, of our uh, species and taxon, not 
in ancient catastrophes or uh, universal deluge or uh, things which are outside our experience, but around us, in the things we see around us, in the actual world around us. This was the most important idea Darwin got from the geologists. This was the attitude of the geologist like Lyell, and he introduced this position in biology, in natural sciences. This was very important. In fact, his supporters, as Lyell or Huxley, didn't believe in natural selection, but in evolution, evolution by natural causes. This was the point. Not out of nature causes. And uh, this was very important for the history of science. After Darwin, far causes were abandoned and uh, people started uh, uh, scrutinizing the world with the common terms, with the terms of the common life. And this was the real Darwinian contribution to introduce back the, the language of uh, everyday into the scientific discourse and not to speak of uh, cataclysms and things like that as uh, catastrophists so was, uh, were named uh, Ed Dunn. One of them is the famous Cuvier, the French uh, geologist, uh, anatomist. Are you, are you saying that Darwin introduced gradualism, the idea of gradualism? As a, uh, in, Darwin in preferred biology. gradualism because gradualism could help him in explaining the origin of species without recurring to some jump, some uh, external mm -hmm. uh, impression. By gradualism, he meant a, a transformation, a slow transformation, generation after generation which could be explained by chance modifications. I need a little water to go ahead. May I have some water? Uh, sure. <clears throat> so, to resume, I can say Darwin re or introduced rationalism in science. Gradualism? Or no, also gradualism. Gradualism okay. is a way to make rational, uh, difficult things, to okay. explain the difference, the, 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 the transformation, let's say, of an ape to a man. A single jump is very difficult to um, represent. A lot of gradual uh, transformations is more, uh, let's say, reasonable, more, more rational. doesn't require anything but just chance modifications and, as you know, natural selection. Yes. Now, the next question you have me, you have listed here, are there other me mechanisms besides mutation selection? And is that question related, is, is related to the first? Well, you ask if there are alternative mechanisms besides mutation and selection to explain the species origin. In fact, Darwin didn't believe too much in natural selection. The late Darwin said that he overemphasized natural selection. In fact, he believed in transformation induced by the environment and transmitted to the progeny something that Lamarck had stated before him. And uh, so mutation is a concept extraneous to Darwin. Darwin didn't use 
this term which appears in the beginning of, of the next century. Darwin spoke of the shent with modification, and this was the key of his theory. The shent with modification, but not modification by mutation, by errors, as we say now. But you asked me if there were alternative explanation to mutation for explaining the origin of species, I, I imagine. Well, in fact, there are a lot of other theories, other marginal theories, which explain. Uh, in fact, they do not explain, but they approach the problem from a different perspective. Well, do you, do you believe that natural selection is adequate to explain all diversity? Well, my answer is no. Natural selection is a very poor uh, mean, means. In fact, when I say in my book, why is a fly not a horse, I want to say that natural selection does not explain this. Because both the fly and the horse are very adapted to life. It's not by progressive adaptation that you can go from one to the, to the other. But there are a lot of different uh, approaches, of course, which are neglected by evolutionists, by official evolutionism. This is perhaps my uh, critics, my main critics. Mutation selection has been adopted as a a kind of uh, toccasana, we say in Italian, of uh, dogma. Yes, dogma, which resolves everything. Is there a word in, in, in to say elisir or something like that? Elisir. Elisir is. Mm. <laughs> what? A formula which resolves everything, but it doesn't. And different concepts have been introduced, not very recently, in the last century in science, as, for instance, the idea of a morphogenetic field, a physical field which is responsible of different morphologies, and it's different, different organs. For instance, a fly has a different morphogenetic field in respect to, to the horse. Well, this doesn't mean much. This is just an approach. But... Uh, Your next question on the list here is, are there ethic, ethical implications... Are there ethical implications of mutation no, selection? Let, let me finish with this. Okay. Because there is an important point and also, I think, clear. I need to show this. I, I don't know if you can see what this is. This is a splash of milk. Now, this is a picture by Darcy Thompson in 1917. This is a new uh, reproduction, but anyway, this picture was uh, by him to mean what? That this is a complex shape, a complex form. But beyond this form, there are no genes. There are no informations at all, but just a drop of milk dropping on the surface of milk. Beyond that, there is no, no special time. This can occur anytime, anywhere. 
still again, there is no selective advantage in this form. There is no adaptation. It doesn't serve anything, but it is perfect, elegant, and self-reproducible. You can drop thousand drops of milk and you get again the same picture. But this is completely extraneous to the idea of mutation selection. Mutation, in fact, there are forms like this in nature, in animals, in plants. Of course, they are not generated by a drop of milk, but different causes. It's another important thing is that you, can't, you can obtain the same form using not a drop of milk, but a little stone. So there is no specificity in the agent, in the casual agent. What does produce forms like this? Mm -hmm. A loss of form, a structured nature, something difficult to define, but not transcendental laws, but physical laws, which we don't know yet, but which can be studied. And this is something extremely interesting, because mutations and genes make their role, have their role in producing organisms, but also laws of growth. They are very important. When we established the Osaka group you mentioned before, we were a group of people from different continents. Strangely enough, from the south of the world, South Africa, Australia, South America, more than from the north. But most of them were really uh, outstanding scientists. Were they, uh, are they uh, critics of, of uh, neo-Darwinism? They were not, not so much critics as unsatisfied with the neo-Darwinism. All of them agreed that neo-Darwinism was not enough to explain, apart from horse and fly, but everything in nature, the origin of species. And so they try, uh, tried to find out an agreement which they didn't. But anyway, to discuss theories not belonging to the officiality of science, mm -hmm. to the normal science, convinced that the future of science in this, is in these small marginal theories, and they shouldn't be uh, relegated out. Is, uh, relegated is, is an English word. No, I don't know. They shouldn't be uh, discarded because they are the future of science. And mutation selection has the, 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 the device, the, the negative point of not being an inconvincing theory, but of ruling out the other theories of Impeding, impeding other approaches to develop. Mm -hmm. This is also important in the, in the schools. If we are only taught natural selection, we are not contributing to the development of science, but just to blocking science to a given view. And this is what we should avoid in schools, to give a dogma and say this is the truth. You don't go, don't look outside because you can get confused. No, this is not way of teaching science. Uh, or can we move uh, to the next question? Are there ethical implications of mutation selection? This is a very delicate point. Surely there are ethical implications. I had a pain. Mutation selection, particularly selection, implies 
as in the title of the work by Darwin, Struggle for Life, the affirmation, the, the victory of the stronger over the weaker, a continuous conflict between people and races and species and whatsoever. So the moral, the ethical view which comes out from mutation selection theory, not evolution, evolution is a larger concept, mutation selection, particularly selective theory, is a continuous struggle, battle for prevailing, for abolishing the minorities. This is the, the critical point in Darwin. There is a sentence of Darwin which is really terrible and incredible. Assuming that man derives from the ape, which is a very questionable point. Uh, Dr. Schimante, uh we're running into a bit of a time crunch here, and I, I would like, before I get to your next question on the list, to ask you just to comment briefly on a couple of changes in the uh, indicators. You see on the screen under 1C on the right, we say the sequence of nucleotide bases within genes is not dictated by any known chemical or physical law. Is that a valid scientific statement? Well, this is surely true. But it's not an ethical matter. Yes. We were speaking of, of this ethical. Maybe you don't like me to go in. Well, uh, I am, uh, I am got four minutes left, and I wanted to ask you a couple of other questions. Yes. Uh, and maybe we no, can get no, back to let that. Let me read just one sentence okay. uh, of Darwin. He says, he wrote, at some future period, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. And so on. This is uh, just a, a flower. That's so one of the ethical... Very serious. And when Darwin is, is taught in the schools, I, I ask myself, should we teach to the boys even this sentence of Darwin, this idea of Darwin, or be able to criticize it a little, to, to introduce the ideas of Darwin, obviously, but also some critics in some crucial point, as this idea of extermination of uh, uncivilized races. Then uh, I think what you are saying is that when we teach uh, evolution, we should be teaching the theories and the tenets of it, but also the scientific criticisms? Obviously, yes. Okay. In any case, for, for any theory taught in the school, we should have a, a counterpart. It's, okay. the, it's the way to understand things. And I believe that's the word that's used in the standards, understand biological evolution. And in... You'll notice on the screen, it says 1A, biological ev evolution postulates an unpredictable and unguided natural process that has no discernible direction or goal. Is that a valid statement? That's true. I, I agree with this sentence. It's okay. yours. And then the next sentence, it also assumes that life arose from an unguided natural process. Is that true? Surely, the, the, okay. the spontaneous, so-called spontaneous generation, the origin of life. I believe we have this a couple. This is one, minutes. sorry, of the questions we should say we don't know. But not only we don't know, but we will never know about. Because we cannot understand the origin of something from nothing. Yes. The last question you had on your list here was, did molecular evolution fit the Darwinian picture? This is a complex question. If you have only one minute, <laughs> it's hard to... The answer is no. Molecular evolution didn't uh, fit the expectations of uh, 
Darwinism, of uh, selectionism, because the comparison, uh, the molecular comparison of different species demonstrated differences in the text of DNA. Mm -hmm. But these differences were never selective, ne never adaptive. They were neutral, mm -hmm. so irrelevant for the form and the function of the organism. So my answer is no. Thank you very much. I uh, believe we're at the, the time, is that correct? Or you have two minutes? Two minutes. Um, I want to say the last sentence about my 